I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Welcome, welcome all, good evening my name is Tucker Hyatt. I'm the founding director of Wonderfest, the Bay Area, the 25-year-old Bay Area beacon of science. All right. Dr. Bernard Lewis is Emeritus Cooperative Extension Specialist in UC Berkeley's Department of Environmental Sciences, Policy, and Management. I met Dr. Lewis at Cal, go Bears, before he was a doctor. In 1972, 51 years ago, he was already a big shot, a resident assistant at my UC Berkeley dorm. We have been friends ever since. Bernard earned his PhD in entomology at Cal, and soon Dr. Lewis joined the Cal faculty, specializing in urban entomology, authoring or co-authoring more than 150 technical papers and giving, giving hundreds of lectures and presentations. He has traveled all over the world to consult on pest eradication. Chile, Pakistan, Egypt, I believe, always one step ahead of the law. <laughs> and he has chaired the United Nations Termite Dream Team, the Global Termite Expert Group, the Dream Team. Dr. Lewis has in, was inducted into the Pest Management Professionals Hall of Fame in 2016. And just about then, he reached the pinnacle of esteem in his in his through his career by becoming a Wonderfest advisor, a formal member 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 of the Wonderfest advisory board. Please join me in welcoming the creepy crawler Hall of Famer, Dr. Bernard Lewis. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tucker, and and welcome to all. I am truly honored to to, to be here to speak to you today. Uh, my passion are of course insects. I have an intriguing title here, and over the next 45 minutes, I hope to entertain and enlighten you, and I'll give plenty of time for questions. So you've got my title up there. Now, uh, here's an outline. This, this is my pledge to you, what I hope to do in the next 45 minutes. I'll start off with the PowerPoint talk, and we talk about the beauty and wonder of insects. Then we have to talk a little bit about what's a pest, and I'll give you uh, one more definition, and then we'll roll into some pests, some you know, some you don't. And then I'll finish off with the strange title called Indoor Biome. So are you ready to rock and roll? All right. I think for many of you, when you think of all of us are had some encounter of insects, and this image you see is a walking stick. It's This is big, uh, and, I, and I for scale, and it's always kind of hard on, on Zoom to give you scale, but you can you see that quarter on the back of that insect. Uh, I'm gonna stop it right here because for some of you who don't get that scale, I want to hold this up. I actually have this insect with me. I hope you can. Can you guys see this? If I hold it up. Yes. That's a big insect. Look at it next to my head. This is one of the largest insects in the world. It's a walking stick. We have smaller ones in California. This one's from Papua New Guinea. I use this as a concrete example of, of how large and unique and fascinating insects are. Now, of course, insects come on the other extreme. And that little image on the right are parasitic wasps that attack the eggs of other insects. Again, it's hard on the screen, but I have another little prop here. See this little box with all those little pins? And you see those little paper points? And I think you guys see these dots on the end. Those are tiny insects. And this particular uh, prop, I actually pinned these. I worked for the Entomological Museum back in 73. So these things are over 50 years old. I show you these two together to show you the extreme size difference in insects. Now, remember insects, we all know <clears throat> they have three body parts and 10, and, and the adults have six legs. They may have wings. So, but but the, the beauty of insects, they have the same general formula and they're kind of like transformers, how they trans, whether they're big or small, they all have the same general body plan. Uh, the other thing that people are kind of interested, uh, and, and this is kids, I, I, I get to see hundreds of kids every year talk about my passion of insects. 
That image you see is a piece of amber. That's Dominican amber. That's actually my hand. That particular piece of amber is 20 million years old. It contains termites that are hard to see, but, but there, there are actually cockroaches that they found in amber that go back 300 million years. So insects, of course, have a long, long history on earth. That next image, I'm sure you all recognize it, the monarch butterfly, very common in, in, in California. It's an endangered species now, very beautiful insect. And, and then, of course, I'll show you the uh, a sharpshooter. This particular one comes from Costa Rica. A sharpshooter is a type of insect. It's a flown feeder. It feeds on the plumbing system of other plants. Now, when, it, when insects aren't being fascinated in us and showing us their beauty, they, they are also worshipped. And I think many of you are aware that scarab beetles were worshipped by Egyptians. Those are dung beetles. Uh, they, they, they recycle dung. So, you know, today we're talking about recycling uh, our, our resources. And insects, uh, particularly uh, in this case, the dung beetles, have been doing this for millions of years. In fact, some studies claim the dung beetles were around with the dinosaurs. So before they were being worshipped by humans, they were helped uh, re recycle nutrients from dinosaurs. Now, uh, sometimes you actually put insects to work. And this is a, a, a picture from Fresno. I have some friends who are farmers in Fresno. Every once in a while, they let me take a picture of their, their agriculture. This happens to be cotton. And, and, uh, but but uh, we, we sometimes put insects to work, honeybees. Honeybees are pollinators. I think many of you already know that. Uh, actually, you probably have read that honeybees are also endangered here in North America and parts of Europe. Uh, you probably also read in the news that we're vaccinating our honeybees now for some of the viral and bacterial diseases they can get. I think they're the first example of insect. But, but in case, insects, uh, in case of honeybees, they're important for the $60 billion farm economy in the state of California. It's a free source of labor. If we had to do that with our technology or by hand, it would cost in, in, inorbitant amounts of money. Now, this is why I need a little help from you guys. Now, I've, I've told you the good things about insects, but sometimes we call them pests. So maybe Tucker can help me. Uh, Tucker, can you name me a pest? Are you out there? I'm. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Anybody? I'm not in the chat room, so I can't tell. Oh, Lots dear. Oh, ah, there you are. Yeah, sorry. Eric, Eric muted me. I, I, I don't I don't uh, do well muted. Uh, let's see. You want a pest, a, a non-human pest? Whatever you want. Na name me a pest. When oh, you think okay. when you hear the word pest, what do you think of? Okay, mosquito. Mosquito. And I have one more. Termite. A termite. Okay. Now, now it's my turn to 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 uh, give you my example. Can you guys see this? Yes. Any thoughts what this might be? No, it's not an oatmeal cookie or, or, or you know, chocolate chip. What do you think? Uh, uh, how about this? You see that image up there? Oh, Exotic no. range land and dung beetles and, and cultural. This is actually a cow pat. From California, uh, this it's wrapped in cellophane. It's dried out. It's not going to hurt me. But uh, I was part of a study when I actually when I was an undergrad at Cal. We looked at the impact of, of cow manure on California ecosystems. We had too much of it. Probably what you guys don't know, cows uh, actually defecate twenty times a day, and you have millions of head. That's a lot of stuff. But what you don't know, and, and I. I think you can see this text. You see that yellow highlight that says only in cow dung and the dried out slabs of dung, which become pests. Hello. This is probably the most extreme example I know of a pest. The reason I bring that up to you because often people forget God, Buddha, and Allah didn't create pests. It's a human defined term. There's a lot of variance in, in what people perceive or call pests. So 
remember that not only as we go through the rest of my talk, but in your discussions with your friends and family members. There's a lot of variance in, in what people think are, are, are pests out there. It's a human defined term. Now, another little definition. Some of you guys might hear the terms economic versus medical versus urban entomology. And, and you know, oftentimes in, in educated societies and technical societies, we throw these terms out. Well, what do they really mean? Are they the same? They are not equivalent. I think most people, when they think of economic urban entomology, they think of agriculture, where you put in inputs like fertilizers, water, sun, pesticides, and you get a crop that you sell and make money. In the case of medical entomology, you think of maybe malaria, where people get sick, they, they die or they go in the hospital. But when it comes to urban entomology, which is a big component of what we do in North America, how is urban entomology defined? And what's the important aspect of it? And with urban entomology, it's not, it's not water, it's not fertilizer, it's not pesticide. It's this term we call a steady. Now you might ask, well, what the heck is a steady? And, and here's another little bit of an animation. This is a piece of pizza that was laying on the ground for a while. And yeah, there's these, these wormy things jumping all around it and making people go, ooh, ah, ah, ah. And, and I call that the yuck factor. So the thing that makes urban entomology unique is one of the most important benchmarks for measuring it is something called aesthetic injury, which I, you know, uh, another way of saying it in layman's term is the yuck factor. And by the way, those are maggots from what uh, this particular insect is called a black soldier fly. And those of you who might wonder what the heck is a fly, it's a type of insect uh, that has the three body parts and six legs and wings. In the case of flies, it has two wings and they belong into the Latin name diptera, which all it means is two wings. So a lot of entomology isn't rocket science. It's just a, a lot of common sense that's put into Latin. Now, with that as a backdrop or a basis, I want to move you through some a few examples of, of pests. And I think you guys might recognize some of these. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me grab another little prop here. Cockroaches. I think you guys recognize cockroaches. It's hard on Zoom, but can you guys see these, these cockroaches here in my hand? These are, you won't find these in, in, as pests in North America. These are from Madagascar. Oftentimes people use these to feed their, their lizards. Or, or, or Bernard, can you, can you raise your hand just a bit, Bernard, uh, higher up near the webcam? Yeah, can you see those? That's a big cockroach, right? They're called hissing cockroaches. Sometimes they hiss if I pinch them enough. All right, but the ones that some of you might remember, Tucker and I were in the dorms, for a number of years, we saw a lot of things running around on university property. I'll leave it at that. That that large animal on the upper left is called an American cockroach. You may you may see those running around in commercial facilities. Then we have the the black water bug. Sometimes people call that one on the right the Oriental cockroach. That bottom one with the stripes is a German cockroach. And that one to my far lower right is called a brown banded cockroach. Those are the principal cockroach pests traditionally in California. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to make you look a little cross-eyed. All those common names are, 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 are con considered, uh, uh, we're not going to use those anymore because they're ethnic slurs. So, so you, and you, you see, we're doing it with buildings, we're doing it with cities, we're doing it with monuments. We're, believe it or not, we're getting rid of the ethnic slurs with cockroach names, at least the common names. These particular insects also have Latin names. Of course, you guys are probably wondering what the, the American cockroach, that's called Parapolinida americana. And then the other one is Blata orientalis. Then there's Blatella dramatica and Supella longipalpa. Those are meaningless to you because you, you guys haven't had the technical training but we're gonna move away from ethnic slurs. Now you might wonder, how is that an ethnic slur? Let's pick on that one that's German cockroach. That's the common name. Its Latin name is Blatella dramatica. Linnaeus in the 1700s named it 
you know, he was the first one that used Latin names to describe animals and plants that we continue the tradition today. The reason why he called it the German cockroach because Sweden was fighting a war with Germany. So he names it after someone he doesn't like. The American cockroach has another fascinating story. It got that name because Linnaeus's disciples in the New World, when they came back from, from the Americas, he saw this insect, he called it Paraplanita Americana. That means wandering insect from the Americas. The trouble is the American cockroach actually is indigenous to Africa. So common names are, are, are meaningless and we're trying to shift more to more realistic names that focus on the locality maybe, or perhaps some unique feature. So you, you guys got all that? All right, now. Those are the ones you've seen before. Now, I'm going to show you a couple new ones that you probably may have seen but didn't recognize. These are in California today. There's this uh, Blatta orientalis. Sometimes they, they call it the black water bug. You may have seen this in your outdoor settings near the fill, your pool filters. There's another one called the Turkish stand, Shafella della lateralis. That's new in the state. And don't, these are hard to tell apart. You're going to look at them and tell me, wow, what, what the heck's the difference? They're both kind of yellow looking. Some have wings, some don't. The males have wings, the females don't. The only way to tell them apart is there's a little yellow on that Turkestan cockroach. You might wonder, how do we get something from Turkestan? A lot of that has to do with international travel. Sometimes the U.S. military, when they bring back stuff on, 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 on wooden uh, uh, um, cargo bays, they, they sometimes will, will come on in, in, into our ports of entry. The, the big deal on that is the Turkestan cockroach outcompetes the oriental cockroach and produces more babies. You guys may see more and more of this in the state. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you another one that just popped up less than 10 years ago in Northern California. It has a lovely name called the three-lined cockroach. And if you look at that image on your left, you see it looks like three lines going down the back. You know, there's that one in the middle and two along the edge. That's actually an adult. That's not a nymph because it those are wing bases. Now, and, and here's it's increasing its range around the state. You might wonder what's the big deal on that one? Well, remember when I showed you the German cockroach, Platella dramatica? It has two stripes on it. Three line has three stripes. So it's kind of hard to tell these apart unless you know what you're looking for. But it's the three line cockroach is on the move around California right now. It prefers being outside. But when it gets wet and rainy, like it has been for the last couple of weeks, these come inside and people get a little upset about it. And they, they can get into your water meter boxes. Now, I'm sure there are many of you out there who cannot stand cockroaches. You just want to get rid of them. So I have to say a little bit about what happens with cockroach control. I'm sure many of you, maybe not in your homes, but when you were renting or maybe in, in growing up, you, you might remember buying spray cans or your folks hiring people to control them. And they use liquid dust gels and baits. Right now, the preferred treatment is baits. Uh, what you probably don't know is parasitic fungi and parasitic nematodes have also been used to control cockroaches, particularly outside. That's a type of biological control. So people have said, oftentimes you hear people don't want to use pesticides. Are there other ways of, of trying to kill cockroaches? And yes, you can use other life forms. Sometimes you can just heat the place up. You can also inject carbon dioxide. Yes, there have been fumigations that use carbon dioxide to kill uh, cockroaches. Probably the most unique way of killing cockroaches is just having moving air. And that's in the city of Santa, Santa Barbara in Southern California. Sewers are notorious for having cockroaches. You can't put pesticide in the sewer because it gets into the water table and oceans. So it's been shown from researchers in Alabama that just if you put a certain wind speed in those tunnels, it discourages cockroaches. And then, of course, we have pheromone traps 
because these insects find each other using sex and aggregation pheromones. But that's not all. Here we have a tiny wasp. Remember I showed you earlier those tiny wasps? There are tiny wasps that attack the egg cases of some cockroaches. This is a method of control that historically has been used on the Berkeley campus. Yes, it's non-chemical. Yes, it uses natural biological control. But sometimes people get a little nervous when you use a wasp to control a cockroach. You often wonder what's the lesser of two evil. And then this bottom image, yeah, I know that's bay leaves, coffee, and baking soda. You're going to go, why am I showing you stuff from Safeway? These are also products that have been used to control cockroaches. Believe it or not, bay leaves have a repellent component in their leaves that repel cockroaches. Caffeine, I think you all know this, is a nerve poison and a very potent one on all kinds of life forms. And then baking soda has been used as a, as a stomach poison for all kinds of insects, historically anyway. All right. Now that's all I'm gonna say on cockroaches. I wanna move to ants. And with all this rain going on, my, I'm getting all kinds of emails and, and phone calls from people asking, what's up with the ants? Yes, the ants are on the move. The principal, I should tell you, California has several hundred species of ants. So most ants are out there in the back 40, they're up there trying to do their part to save the environment. They have no involvement with humans. It's this particular one, the Argentine ant, the Pithima humili. By the way, it's not from Argentina. It's probably from Brazil. So much for common names. This is the number one ant pest in the state of California. Uh, you might, you're probably wondering, why do I have this ant colony under your house? It's not an ant colony under your house. It's under the entire state. Remember, this is an invasive ant from mo most of, of, of from probably parts of, of Brazil. And so they have a narrow genetic bottleneck. So they're mostly all related. So these ants easily uh, can come get together during the colder parts of the year. Remember, they're from the tropics. And when it gets cold and ugly, they come indoors. The secret to fighting ants is you have to battle them when they're outside earlier in the year. Now, uh, a lot of people ask, well, why do they come inside anyway? One uh, theory is from uh, Dr. Deborah Gordon at Stanford that says the, the, the cold rain, the drop in temperature and the waters drives them in. There was Dr. Steve Soya, tragically he died much too young. His theory was that no, actually it's, when in the spring of the year, when you when if you have enough rain and you get a lot of aphids and scale, that allows the ant populations to build up. And they become overly abundant, and then when the weather turns, they come inside. The, the reality is it's probably a combination of both th those theories. But but at any rate, a lot of people don't like ants. You don't die from Argentine ants, and you might. I, I should probably back up and tell you. How do I know they're Argentine ants anyway? Well, they have one hump and, and, they, and, and they don't smell. So you might wonder, what do you mean one hump? The way ants are put together, they have the head, the thorax, and abdomen. But between the thorax and the abdomen, there's a little uh, a body part called a petiole. So ants are kind of like camels. You have a one hump camel and a two hump camel. Same thing with ants. You have a one hump ant and the two hump ant. And the pedial region allows flexibility between the abdomen and, and the thorax. And remember, many ants have stingers. So the, the way it works in the ant world, if you're a two hump ant, generally you have a stinger. If you have one, hand, one hump ant, you don't sting, but they're so small anyway, it's hard for, for you guys to learn. Now, I know the difference because I know shortcuts, you guys don't. So traditionally what people did was spray the outside of the building. Some of you older people in the audience might remember when we use power sprayers, the problem with spraying on the outside of buildings, like when we have now, there's a lot of rain. So, so the, the state's trying to wean us away from all these liquid pesticide applications, particularly on hard surfaces that run into stormwater drains, to, to using the more humane treatment called uh, baits. And, and there are many baits out there. there there'll be more ones developed. The problem with baits 
is it takes time for them to be effective. It's a better way of dealing with colonies versus spraying. The problem with spraying, when you spray those ant lines, you're thinking you're killing a lot of ants, you're not. 90 some percent of the colony is hidden from view. You're better off having a bait, a sugar bait with a, a toxic ingredient in it that the ants do the work and take it back. It's just, you have to be patient. It can take days for that. And you guys want those suckers killed in a nanosecond. All right, now termites. We have to talk about termites because I imagine many of you out there are homeowners and, and you guys, and this is a video, I think you can see a video. These are damp wood termites. So damp wood termites are the largest uh, termite in the state of California. We have about 25 species of termites in the state. The only state that has more than us in diversity is Florida and Arizona, but we have a rich assortment. Now, uh, um, so the most common termite you run into in California is called the Western Subterranean Termite. Now, what's in the name? Now, I'm not going to go into the Latin name. That basically means they have a netted wing, and, and, and that's that Hesperus part has to deal with there in the West. But the main thing to, to know is uh, the soldiers have a square head. Now, remember, termites are, again, they're like transformers. You got workers that do one they mostly find the food, dig the tunnels, do all the grunt work. You got the soldiers doing defense, you know, and you might wonder what are they defending against? Ants. Ants kill far more termites than any human ever has. And then that bottom image are the a legs. They're normally black in color and they have four wings. Now, the reason why I bring that up, when this rain stops and we got a sunny day, you will see these swarmers. We have a spring swarming species of subterranean termite in the state. So uh, um, be aware of that. Now, now, I've talked a lot about termites, but I have to tell you there's been some problems with naming termites. That image on the upper left are termite wings. Now, termites, uh, classically, when I was trained, termites are in the order I stop draw. You might wonder, what's that mean? It means same wing. So they have four wings and they all look the same. Okay, that's fine. Now I show you the wings from a cockroach. This is an American cockroach. It also has four wings, but notice the front wings look a little different from the hind wings. The hind wings have this anal lobe. And you're gonna go, well, you know, those look different, except for this guy here. These are the wing venations from Mastotermes darwinensis. This is the most primitive termite in the world found in Australia. I've seen this beast. It's, it's a termite with attitude. I'll just leave it with that. Notice its second wing has a lobe like that cockroach. See that? Because what I'm trying to do is, is demystify a lot of that science that, that, that you guys see. A lot of people say, well, I can't do science. Yes, you can do science because science is a lot simpler than you think. The other thing that master termites, that's a termite does, is it has an egg case. Does this egg case look familiar? Have you remember the German cockroach? It also has an egg case. Now, Linnaeus maybe didn't know, but his disciples over a hundred years ago saw these differences and were a little nervous. But, you know, back in the day, they didn't have fancy technology. So they put the termites in one order or one little category and the termites, in an, uh, the termites and cockroaches in another one. And then came DNA. And, and has anyone, well, I can't hear you guys. I'm sure many of you have tested your DNA for ancestry or 23andMe. And, and weren't we all surprised? You know, our grandparents tell us one thing, but the DNA says something else. So they actually did that with cockroaches and termites. They took a bunch of termites and a bunch of cockroaches and did a little DNA test. And voila, turns out, Termites fit snack dab in the middle of all the diversity of cockroaches. So you might wonder, well, what's that mean? Well, it became official. In 2018, the scientific world say, guess what? Termites are just social cockroaches. Now, we're still trying to live with that consequence. And I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that. And some of you are probably looking a little cross-eyed at that because you're going, it's okay to have termites, but it's not okay to have cockroaches, but they're social cockroaches anyway. Um, and if you think you're a little 
you can't get your mind around this. Think of poor me. I wrote 150 papers that had the wrong order name that has to be <laughs> rechanged. <laughs> now, I want to go a little bit into uh, the, the damage that termites do, and I, I need another prop here. Why are homeowners so nervous about termites? And I think I have a board. You see this board here? This piece of wood. And by the way, you know why we use wood in California, right? It was a renewable resource and we have earthquakes. Remember, we tried bricks and didn't work. So we use wood. In this position, this piece of wood's okay. Look in this position. See all those holes from termites? The reason why termites are difficult for homeowners is we can't always see what they do. So that's why, you know, the real estate companies get upset and the banks get upset. We have a pest control industry. So you can protect your, oh, I think the average cost in California is, is about a million bucks. We have a lot invested in our homes. We want nasty things happening to them. All right. So this image on your left is damage from subterranean termites. So they are the ones that live in the ground and they you see this laminated banded appearance of, of damage to the wood. You might wonder, why did they do it this way? They like to eat the spring growth and not the summer growth of trees. I think many of you know that trees have growth rings. The, the spring growth is a lot nutritious and easier to eat than the summer growth. So the subterranean termites take advantage of that. And the other telltale sign is the damage that they bring along with them. It's like humidified freeways. That lower image is my finger showing a big mud, this happens to be from Thailand, a big mud tube. And if you break it open, you'll see uh, subterranean termites out there. Now, drywood termites are very, very different. They do not require soil contact. They make, basically, they make their own water. And you might wonder, how does that happen? You see it every day. We as humans, if you go next to a mirror and huff and puff on it, you get water vapor on that. We expel it as part of our respiration process. When termites eat the wood, they conserve it. They recycle it. So it's a very, very different system. So this is the, the, the termite that you'll see. Uh, they make these pellets. That's in here. They look like pepper. I'm sure many of you have been in Southern California and in the Bay Area, you've seen these little pellets. You think they're pepper, you might, or sand falling out of your ceilings. No, it's a termite that's, that's evolved to, to, to live here in California. By the way, this termite's been in California for millions of years. We're the newbies, not them. All right. Now, we have to control termites. This particular image is our dry, dry wood termite. Notice its head is a little different. It's not square like the other ones. So you might wonder if you have these, and some of you probably had a termite inspection and a treatment, they'll either do a local treatment where they drill or spray something in a board or a series of boards, or they'll fumigate. That's what these big circus tents are around. California does the most dry wood termite fumigations in the nation, uh, closely followed by Florida and Hawaii. For our subterranean termites that live in the ground, you have to do something at the ground level. Traditionally, they put a chemical uh, termatocyte to form a barrier under the, the structure and these termites. Obviously, the state wants to step phased out because of water quality issues. So they're trying to get consumers and the industry to adapt to using baits. Yeah, I'm sure some of you out there have seen these little green things sticking in the ground. Don't pull them out because they're normally bait stations with a, a, a bait that the, the subterranean termites eat and take it back to the nest. You can probably see a problem with baits right away. Remember I told you with ants, you got to be patient for it to work. It takes even longer uh, uh, for termites to work. In the case of ants, we're talking days. In the case of subterranean termite colonies, it could take months. That's when new innovation will come in time. Now, I have to talk to you a little bit about a new invader in the time I have left. This is called the Formosan subterranean termite. It's actually not from Formosa, it's mainland China, but close enough. Its head is a little different. It is teardrop shaped. Now you're going to say, why am I showing you this? Well, uh, this is a very famous termite. It's in California now and expanding its range. Many of people consider this the most destructive termite in the world. It's in Southern California right now. 
Some people claim there's some strange stuff happening up in Northern California, north of us, we'll see in time. What's the big deal about this termite? Their colonies can number in the millions. These are mud tubes on people's walls. They've been known to eat pianos, wooden baby carriages, silk, linen, whatever. It goes on and on and on. Here's the stuff that really drives people crazy. This termite can have millions of individuals and they can eat a kilogram of wood per day. That's like two and a half pounds of wood per day. Your average two by four stud in your wall weighs eight pounds. So this, this is no joke. This is a serious insect. Now, here's uh, some images from Dr. Uh, uh, Chow Yang Li in Riverside where they're battling this beast now. That's a lot of termites in that piece of wood. The soldiers bite and uh, see that, and they, they blow these white bubbles at you. That's soldiers in someone's hand. So uh, we, this is the only termite in the state that'll do that. And they make this stuff. Here's one of their pieces of, of nest. It looks like concrete. By the way, this is a small piece in Japan where they're native. I've seen some of this stuff that, weigh, that weighs 400 pounds. So it, it's a serious beast. I bring that up because they are right now on the move. They started in San Diego and the Riverside. They're in Los Angeles and they're on the move. We won't know for sure how fast or where they're moving northward, and, but you can bet after the rains, it's going to be interesting in the state. Just the last few more, some images. Just look at this. I'll click on this one here. Look what it does to wood. This is from someone's home in Southern California from 2021. So this is real stuff that the southern part of the state is battling now. Okay, let's get out of this. Now, I, I don't want to end on a bad note for, for termites because they do, uh, and these are, you guys have probably heard of the mound termites in Africa and Australia. These particular ones are, are from Australia. That's, that's me and Mike Haverty and me and Lisa, my wife, Haverty and his wife, uh, lovely Marsha. Uh, termites pr provide a natural service to the ecosystem. So we can't say all bad things about termites because it's their job in many parts of the tropics to eat all that elephant grass. You know all that elephant grass you see on National Geographic that's 10 feet tall? Do you really think all the elephants eat it? Actually, most of it is cut up and drug into these, these termite mounds. So, so and, and the researchers are aware of that. It's just we have to remind the general public, but ter termites do good things. All right. Yeah, I got to mention one more pest. We have to mention bed bugs. Uh, uh, this is obviously this is an insect, three body parts, head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. Yes, they are blood feeders. Um, this is a, a female, male. It goes through nymphal instars. By the way, this insect is not very big. And you might wonder, well, why are bed bugs so small? Look, if these bed bugs were the size of, of dogs or cats, <clears throat> humans wouldn't allow them. They'd see them too easy. Normally with pests in urban environment, they're normally very small and they come out at night. Why? Because if, if they don't, people will throw shoes at them or sick their pets on them. So these are small insects. That's the egg. That's a millimeter long. And then they go through five nymphal instars and they become adults. Now, you might wonder, what's this dark stuff in their body? That's blood. Now, um, and by the way, they don't just suck on human blood. I used to have bed bug colonies when I was a, a, a full-time researcher. They will eat chicken blood, rabbit blood, dog blood, rat blood. I have gotten them to feed on, on chicken broth, but that's that's a research. I, I shouldn't tell you that because you have to understand, uh, I was an international scientist. So at the international level, we see a lot of nuances in life that you guys can't even dream of. But normally bed bugs are small, they're cryptic. By the way, this particular one is Cymex lectularis. That's a human bed bug. Be advised, our, our birds and bats also have bed bugs. So uh, the beasts are in the same family. So bed bugs have been here long before they were humans. Uh, but they're they're confused. You know, these are bed bugs. That's a bed bug. That's a aphid that sometimes people call, they'll say, hey, you know what? I got this little green thing. I think it's a bed bug. No, it's not. There's some corticals. 
Uh, bed bugs don't have cornicles. There's called book lice. The way to tell bed bugs is they have a stylet for feeding underneath them. But when in doubt, always look for help with bed bugs because they can be sneaky and hard to detect. Now, you might wonder, where do these bed bugs come from anyway? Here we go again. Normally, developed countries always want to blame Africa or the Middle East in their bat caves, and because uh, that's just the way. There's this phobia that developed countries have with undeveloped countries. Uh, but they recently did beat DNA on bed bugs, and what they found out, uh, yeah, humans are two million years old. Uh, bats are 20 million years old. Bed bugs are 100 million years old. They probably hung around out with dinosaurs. So again, they were here first and we're the invaders. You know, we'll just have to adjust our minds accordingly. Um, of course, you're going to ask, how do you get rid of them? Now, that's a tough one. The, bet, the thing about bed bugs is you have to document that, in fact, it is a bed bug. And how do you do that? What well, the best way is to use monitors. These black little ashtrays are actually bed bug monitors or part when I was doing research. You actually try to demonstrate that you ha have a sample. You can't go by people and bites because sometimes th those things that people say are bed bug bites aren't bed bug bites. They're zits, the reaction to, 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 to allergens in the environment. But the thing about with bed bugs is you still have to find them and treat them. And does it matter? You know, you're not going to play spray people's stuff with a pesticide. You can't even heat this place up. You're going to hear about heat treatments for bed bugs. You do a lot of heat treatments for bed bugs. But if you have a lot of clutter or other revolving issues uh, pertaining to how people store stuff, it can inhibit any treatment protocol you use. The last thing I'll have to mention is indoor biome. I think I have about five minutes to get through this. I think when most people think of habitats, particularly in California, they think of agriculture, you know, in the Central Valley, particularly now that, that the hills are, are green. You may think of the great redwood forest to the north. You may think of the tropics. You may think of our deserts. But you know what the fastest growing habitat in the world is right now? Inside buildings. We keep building buildings, you know, People don't want to live on the back 40 by themselves. And if they do, they're going to build a mega estate. Here's an example of a Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, New York, New York City. If you look at the actual land area that all those skyscrapers sit on, it, it's, it's 59 square kilometers. That's about 36 square miles. But if you look at the indoor space created by all those buildings, it's almost three times as much. That's three times more space inside, nice and warm and cozy, food, water, shelter. And there have been a number of researchers in North America traveling around, trying to get an idea of what's going on inside buildings. And that, that woman, Dr. Uh, Michelle Leon, was a postdoc at the Cal Academy of Sciences. She was the one who gave me some of these slides. So researchers from NC State, and, and also from uh, Cal Academy and actually UC Berkeley, went around, actually went around the world in, in people's homes to see what's going on. So, uh, and, and this is not your normal, I'm sure you guys think you know every square inch of your home, but you're not trained to look for the telltale signs of a dead insect part or a spider part. These people were. So they, this is just one box from one home and it went, in uh, the several hundred homes around the world. And these collected bug parts, live, dead, whatever, thousands of, of insects and spiders were found. Yeah, this is just a, a sampling of it. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, over a hundred species of arthropods from one house. You know, many people don't even think they have anything in their house, but you don't know what to look for. The most common area for, for insects, of course, are basement and crawl spaces. They're ground or below ground. Then the living spaces, the least are in the attic. I think that makes sense. Uh, basically, uh, and I have the book here. It's called Never Home Alone. They also had microbiologists go with these entomologists to actually see what's going on in homes. And what they actually found out, there's a lot going on in homes that people don't see. The bugs, if you think the bugs are, are hard to find, the microbes are even harder. 
So what people are really like in their homes, are, we're kind of like, remember Pig Pen? With, with the uh, Peanuts cartoon where you had this cloud of dust around. People are kind of that way in their stuff. I mean, we're, you know, we think we're super clean in sanitation, but the reality is very different. Even our skin attracts a lot of, of mites and other things. So, so uh, I got to leave some time for, for, for uh, questions. I got to have a summary here. No, no, you don't have to move out. And this is my grandson. He's not moving out of his house because of creatures in his house. He's actually getting ready to go. His name is to here. He's getting ready to go on, on a, a field trip for school. But, but it's, uh, I think going forward with our, our, our modern technology where we can see a lot more things and we worry about a lot more things, if we can just learn to be a little more tolerant of our indoor nature, it'll be a, a better place for us and, and actually the outdoor environment too. And uh, I, I imagine I'm gonna get a ton of questions. Just letting you know, UC Davis has a pest note series. I'm probably not gonna get to all your questions, but at any rate, if you go to UC Davis and look for their pest notes, many of the insects and even more that I mentioned, uh, they're listed in there. They have nice photos on how you can tell you have them and what you can do about it. And then depending upon what county you're in, you see of extension as the master gardener system to assist you. And I wanna thank uh, the Wonderfest folks, <clears throat> Tucker and the slides from Chow Yang Lee and Jeremy Mantanya, what happens to be my nephew who did those videos. I think I'm done. <laughs> I'll stop that. Woo. Great, Bernard, thank you. We're gonna give you some big applause at the end here after you survive the Q&A. I want you to know that during the, the presentation, uh, one of the wonder knots, Joan Kong Levy, in answer to your question of name a pest, cited her husband. <laughs> and well, that, Howard's a wonderful husband. She's blessed to have him. <laughs> oh, you kidding. <laughs> and I wrote privately to Joan that my wife would agree. My wife happens to have typed in here, not about her husband, by the way, but rather about Darlene, my wife's husband. Um, Darlene had a question here. She asks, what has caused the reemergence reemergence of bed bugs? Wow. Okay. Um, there's some interesting theories on that. The one that you most often hear is um, okay. I have to give you a little historical. Theory. Bed bugs have always been a problem throughout human history. Uh, not as as devastating as the plague and fleas, but high up there. And, and if you go into the Louvre, all those little knit combs that they had uh, were for, for bed bugs too. And then DDT. Remember when DDT was discovered, the, the miracle pesticide for World War II? There was a lot of indoor spraying going on with DDT. And some people claim that that kind of dramatically impacted bed bug population. And then we got, oh, silent spring. We said we got, we stopped that. So, and then, then the international traveling. So it's a combination I'm not spraying bedrooms anymore, which we shouldn't have done in the first place. And the international travel, and those things have probably started it. Oh, the other thing is bed bugs have pesticide resistance. So using pesticides is not a good strategy with bed bugs. All right, thanks, Renard. Uh, Joan Kung Livy of the Pesty Husband fame asks, what mm -hmm. uh, are certain woods such as redwood, Douglas fir, et cetera, impervious to termites? Ooh, I like that question. Joan is smart. And of course she was my wife's roommate for many years. So, um, okay. I think one of the perceptions that homeowners have is redwood cannot be eaten by termites. That's not quite true. The more nuanced answer is it's heartwood redwood that has secondary plant compounds that insects don't like to eat. Do you, you, you probably haven't, uh, if you've got, well, if you can, if you go to Home Depot to buy redwood, it's not heartwood, it's sapwood. Sapwood redwood is vulnerable. And getting heartwood redwood is harder to get because that means cutting down very old trees. We don't do that anymore. So that's the nuance in that. Thanks for your question, Joan. Doug fir is very vulnerable to termite attack, by the way. I'm sorry, what is Bernard? Please. You mentioned Doug fir? Yeah. That's its preferred wood. <laughs> oh, man. 
Oh. <laughs> uh, wonder not Stuart Y has typed in a question, but I know Stuart from past adventures here on Zoom. That he's been willing to ask the question on camera. Uh, oh. Stuart, I'm happy to read it for you, but if you're willing, maybe you'll set the uh, standard for boldness, for bravery. There you are, Stuart. Love it. Please ask away. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. I enjoyed it uh, uh, covering the, I guess, most common uh, pests. Um, I was on uh, Amazon recently, and I was looking at some product they have. They call it a uh, professional-grade thermal camera for smartphones, and I'm sure there's other other ones that don't use uh. smartphones, but I was wondering... Um, if these products that are offered as being able to look into your walls and see the termites, do they really work and, and how effective? Wow. They okay. Wow. That's uh, I love that question. And I, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can answer it quickly. All right. Uh, normally, uh, pest control uh, and particularly the products are regulated by the EPA, right? You guys know that. What you don't know is the EPA registration process is more strict for things like termites or chemicals. They don't regulate non-chemical stuff, nor detection. So please, please, please beware. I can tell you a problem with infrared camera. I mean, that was a lot of my research when I was working. Uh, they work best for temperature changes, right? Termites feeding on wood, guess what temperature they are at? The so temperature good. of the wood. Right. What do you see? Not a, uh, sorry. And that, that's the same thing with, I could say the same thing about bed bugs and cockroaches. So, so be careful. And, and, and don't get those ultrasonic devices. They don't do nothing anyway. And, and I've complained to uh, consumer affairs and all that at the state and federal level. That's a loophole they need to fix. I agree. Thank you very much. Okay, so they're not really effective. Uh, no, not really. Save your money. Can I squeeze in another question? Sure. Um, I uh, live down here in Cupertino, and I walk my dog often at night, and I see these um, about three different kinds of cockroaches walking the sidewalks and coming out of the uh, the sewer. Right. Yeah. And they are sometimes three, four inches long, it looks like. I mean, well, maybe three inches long. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's Paraplanita. Remember that thing I called American cockroach? Mm -hmm. uh, California, okay. Most of the cockroaches we see in our urban area are introduced. They were probably brought over here from the conquistadors, to tell you the truth. Uh, but California actually has some native cockroaches. We don't see, uh, I, I, I can't see the audience, but... But there's a thing called a wood roach that you'll see out in the Sierra foothills. It's small and red very fast. And our desert regions have a couple of species. And then we always, uh, we have Cryptocerca. It's, it's a live breeding cockroach in our forested area. So we have about four. But all those other 20 are from other places. Courtesy of international trade, the military and our postal mechanism. I'll leave it at that. I'm trying not to get in trouble with people. <laughs> Remember, I, uh, I get to see a world very different from you guys, right? You guys only see the five-star hotels. <laughs> I see the stuff behind the scenes, and it can get ugly. <laughs> Thanks Thank you. for your question, Stuart. Uh, I don't see a hand raised. Looking forward to it. Maybe a question typed in the chat. But Bernard, let me ask you about an implication in the in Wonderfest description of your talk tonight. Um, that description said that there has been an influence on our three year long tendency to shelter at home on the prevalence of insects, at least certain types in those homes. Can you tell us anything about that? What's sure. happened I, I, in the last three years? Uh, you, know, you know, of course I deal with regulators and pest control industry. So what happens is people are spending a lot of time at home more than they used to. Uh, maybe that's trying to change now, but but staying at home, eating at home, uh, that, that has two consequences. You bring a lot more stuff. Maybe you don't recycle it or take it out soon enough, and you have a lot more time to look around. So all those insects I showed you, they've always been there, but if you're ripping and running and you know, playing soccer mom, you don't notice it as much, but now you do. So yeah, the incidents 
the, the thank God the governor left pest control alone and made it an essential service. It would have been a lot worse. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Darlene Hyatt asks, I consistently make an effort to gently handle and move live spiders found in our house to the outside. I know spiders have positive assets. What are those assets? Oh, well, first of all, what you're probably finding in your home are males uh, and you're looking for a date. That's so, uh, and they're short lived. So uh, whatever happens to them, don't worry about it because they're on their, their last leg. It's the females that, that <laughs> in most life forms that are responsible for procreation and they're more hidden around. You rarely see the females in the home. It's going to be the males. Sometimes with cellar spiders, you might see them. But with spiders, with their niches, they're predators. Now, I, I know we saw that spider movie, Charlotte's Web. And I think she was the vegetarian spider. No, no. Uh, all spiders are, are predators, primarily other arthropods. Some eat fish, some eat birds, some eat small rodents. Those are mostly in the tropics. But... Oh, man. All right. Darlene, thanks for your question. And Mitchell Diamond asks, is it true that bed bugs have an unusual reproductive mechanism? <laughs> yes, I love that question. It's called traumatic insemination. You might wonder, what the heck's that mean? Well, uh, this isn't a, do we have any kids watching? Uh, the male bed bugs have an armored adiagus, and that's the insect equivalent of a penis, they have an adiagus, it's armored. And when they mate with a female, anywhere they can stick her with that thing. So females can die. So that, I'm glad you asked that question. That has co consequences to how bed bugs are distributed in a house. If there are too many males around, because of that traumatic insemination, the females run away because they can die from that. So they, they, they can help spread the infestation. It's bizarre, but hey, what, that's what happens is you got several hundred million years to evolve. Wow, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Bernard. Let me ask a question in here. In your long and rich life and terrifying life with insects, <laughs> what's, the, what's the nastiest sting or bite you've ever received and what delivered it? Wow. Um, well, well, first of all, can I clear, uh, quantify that a little bit? Sometimes people ask me, what's the most dangerous life form on earth? People, by far. I mean, I've never known bed bugs to start World War I, two, or three. It's always people. All right. Now, uh, there was a time when I was an undergrad, I used to volunteer my blood to feed the bed bug colonies. Probably wasn't a smart thing to do because I developed some pretty nasty allergy uh, and allergic reactions to that. But yeah, that's... Uh, that is, you would let the bed, but you volunteer to let the bed bugs bite you. Yeah, hundreds of them. That's, oh. They're blood feeders. By the way, that's illegal today. You can't do that. The journals say you have to feed them on artificial membrane systems. You can't use human subjects anymore. Uh, but I, I, And then the other thing are, of course, yellow jackets and hornets because they can sting you multiple times. A you know, honeybee only gets you once. A uh, hornet, they just keep getting you. So those are pretty nasty. Yeah, I ran into a hornet's nest once, uh, yellow jacket nasty, nest, nasty, nasty, uh, nasty. not pleasant. You can die, people die from that. Oh man, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. We're gonna give Bernard some applause, I hope in a minute. And I end tonight by offering three big thank yous. First to you, I love the wonder not curiosity. Thank you for being here tonight, audience. Second, to Wonderfest supporters and patrons. Wonderfest lives on the, based on the kindness of strangers and friends like you. Thank you for supporting Wonderfest. And finally, big, perhaps American Sign Language, silent applause for Dr. Bernard Lewis, our master of creepy crawlers. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. All right. See you at the next Wonderfest event, one and all.